mm-hmm. introduction, like a radio show type of thing. And then, you know, right. I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Nothing crazy. I'm going to ask you, like, you know, like what age did you enter the NBA and all that other stuff. Because I, I kind of want to motivate people so that, you know, it's never too late type of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like if sure. somebody's 26 right. out there and they're a baller, there's still hope for them. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, you know, that type it. of thing. So, you know, we'll go like on in, in, in a few minutes, we'll, in a few seconds. Okay. I'll just break into it and say, you know, what's up and... You know, welcome right. to the show and all that other stuff. Welcome to the podcast. I got to get used to that same podcast and not show. But okay. I like it, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool. I'm happy with that. I'm actually focused on something. <laughs> you know? That's good, dude. You sound like you're motivated about it. <laughs> yeah, man. All right. So, all right. So, I'm going to add a marker here. Bam. What's up today, everybody? It's Mark Lugo, Broke. Doesn't equal broken. Today, I got a special guest. It's also actually a friend of mine uh, that I met a while back and he's always uh, he always touched a special part of me because uh, he kind of always uh, reminded me of, of something that happened in my own life with my father. My father got a stroke and I remember taking some time off and fishing with my father to rehabilitate him and you know uh, Thank God we uh, rehabilitated him, me and my father working together, and that's, that's we. Me and my father, we worked together, and we went out fishing and did a lot of things for about six months, and got him, uh, got him, uh, got him, got him back in action, and, and unfortunately, he was diagnosed with cancer after that, and he actually died on January 7th, 2007, so... Um, it was only appropriate to, to, um, to invite my friend Hawk, uh, Joaquin Hawkins to the show and, and I will be releasing the show on January 7th, the memory of my father and in memory and not in memory, but in honor of what, uh, Hawk is doing, uh, to help, uh, uh, bring awareness to to stroke because it is a serious thing and I saw it happen in my own family. So without uh, wasting too much time and focusing on Hawk, welcome to the show, Hawk. How you doing, my friend? I'm pretty good, man. Pretty good. Appreciate you uh, allowing me to, to speak with you. And uh, like always, man, uh, I'm here to support, man. So uh, definitely good to, good to talk to you again. Thank you, Hawk. And how's the family, my friend? They're good. They're good. We're uh, trying to stay 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 uh, warm. It's kind of raining out here in California right now, but uh, it's that season. It's uh, winter time, so we're enjoying the indoors right now. <laughs> well, I'm yeah. You know, I'm in Barcelona now, so we just came from uh, from a three a three kings parade outside. I promised okay, my wife okay. and, my, and my son that we would do that before I I got to work because yeah. I I worked late. Uh, being on, right. you know, six or seven hours or nine hours ahead of most of everybody that I talked to, so nice. um, you know, I come, I came back, but I'm, it, it was, it was kind of chilly here. It's like kind of like yeah. the low forties, but it's, it's nice. I mean, you know, being on the Mediterranean and Europe is just a nice place, and you know, I know we talk about it a lot, but I like to see you and your family in Europe this year. So we're gonna work on something together. So hopefully, to get you here, you know what I mean. So, for sure, for sure. That's, that's a good plan to have. So, yes, so I want to ask you a few questions, man. You know, my audience is basically people that are that are kind of not down and out, but but you know have been or have not been or consider themselves too old or you know yeah. not enough experience to do something. So I wanted, I wanna I thought it would be good to to get you on the show because I know you're a motivator. I mean, you motivate me, you inspire me. Um, your book inspires me. Your grandmother inspires me more because you're so inspired by her in the book that you wrote. So, so you know, she inspires me a little bit more than you, but you inspire me. And um, <laughs> and and I, I I wanted to you know I wanted to talk about your age when you entered. Um, you know, what age were you when you entered the NBA? Who uh, I was 29 years old. Um, almost 30 years old and um, you know for me it was uh, obviously a dream that came true but you know I, I never wanted to use and as I always say when I'm talking to 
the kids I'm teaching or if I'm doing any type of motivational speaking, um, you know, age is nothing but the number, and, uh, you know, it's, it's never a better time than now. And so I, I've never wanted to use my age or my situation not to, um, you know, move forward with, with my goals. And my goal was always to make the NBA, and I knew if I just put in the time, the effort, the energy, uh, surround myself with the right people, um, I knew it would eventually happen, and uh, it did. It just uh, just happened when I was uh, almost touching 30. <laughs> So let me ask you a question. Why, why, and this is not on my list of questions, but it's something that came up mm-hmm. now. Why, why didn't you just like, I'm sure there were a lot of people in your circle that are like, dude, you're never going to get into the NBA. You're old, give up already, go get yeah. a job at, you know, whatever, Home Depot or whatever, you know, whatever right. it is that you, you were doing, coaching or whatever else. Why, why you right. never listened to those people and why you never gave up? Why was, what, where did you, where was the light in the end of the tunnel that you saw? Yeah, well, it was it was a, a few things that, um, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, my grandmother, who uh, obviously I, I uh, learned so much from her, and uh, from the the moment she passed away, um, you know, the first thing that she always told me was, you know, to follow my path. And obviously, as a a young teenager, not knowing what that meant, you know, all I know is those are the words, and I had to to really find out what she meant by that. And, um, and you know, I just pretty much daily I um, either work either working on things to uh, enhance my skills um, you know really motivate self motivating myself uh, but you know just one it's more so I knew that if I just you know put myself in the situation uh, being prepared that you know all I would just need is an opportunity and um, so I think just always reminding myself of the words uh, that she instilled in me um, knowing daily that I was doing something to make some progress uh, to do that. You know, that that was enough motivation for me not to listen to those people because, as you said, you know, we all at times, um, you know, we, 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 we listen to people that we feel or we think that are supporting us, uh, but we also have those other people that, you know, they're not as supportive or they're not seeing uh, those motivational things that we need, so we have to find them ourselves. And so that's, that's pretty much what I did. I just found the motivation in myself to, to just keep going. And I, I knew every day if I did something to improve on one aspect of my game or, you know, going to play in one other country that can help me improve my skills, you know, when that opportunity did it present itself, um, which it did um, in 2001, um, playing for Scotty Brooks, and the, who used to coach with the OKC Thunder, I knew if I put myself in a situation for someone like that to see me play, that um, you know my, my opportunity will will, uh, will be able to uh, present itself, and it did. So that was basically your break there. That was the shot that you got to yeah. play for the NBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it actually happened the, the year before I made the, the NBA because, as I said, I, in 2001, I played for um, a local team here in Anaheim. And, uh, you know, only getting paid about five to $700 a month. And, you know, it was, it was a sacrifice. Uh, but it was a sacrifice that was worth it for me because, again, I knew that I put in the, the energy and, and, and the time previous, in previous years, for eight com- consecutive years, playing overseas and, and um, in Japan, playing over in the CBA, I mean, playing in all these small minor leagues to pre- prepare myself. And, um, you know, with him being a former NBA player himself, and I, I played for him for one year, and uh, just being under his his, his guidance, his uh, mentorship, and uh, he was able to to see how I, I could be some type of value to uh, one of those professional NBA teams. And so he just made a call. He made a call, and uh, you know, and the rest is history. So, is is he still around? Uh, yeah, yeah. Scotty Brooks. He is. He's not coaching right now. Um, I know he was up. Uh, coaching with, uh, with the OKC Thunder a few years ago. I'm not for sure where he's coaching right now, but I know um, I talked to him last summer, and I, I know that he's uh, you know trying to get back into coaching in, in the NBA. But uh, he, he's definitely still, still around, I'm sure, doing some, some mentoring, being um, uh, a father uh, of his kids, and his, you know, he's married also. So he, he's definitely still around. All right, so next time you talk to him, can you put in a good word for me and maybe I can get into the NBA? <laughs> I'm only like 59. 
<laughs> I'm only like 59 uh, like, years old. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, as long as you're working on your skills every day, man, all I can do is put in the word for you. It's up to you to, to make it happen. <laughs> I can't even keep up with my nine-year-old son in any sport. <laughs> That's right. That's so, right. so on a scale from one to ten, uh, Hawk, man, why, how, how would you rate the whole NBA experience? I mean, I know you got burnt by Michael Jordan a few times, Kobe Bryant. Uh, I mean, there just you like, go. There you go. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> In saying that, um, you said scale from one to ten. I would give it an eleven plus. It was more than I've ever dreamed of. And you know, again, I, I was a I wasn't a big name player. Um, you know, I, I I made the NBA through my effort and uh, and just you know being being patient, but you know also understanding that you know it's timing. It's it's really timing. And um, you know, I was very fortunate to actually be a starter my first ten games in the NBA. So I, I just that alone, um, it was more than I expected, and uh, definitely the, the one of the best times of my life. So yeah. you would say you would say that you were also grateful for that experience then, right? Yes, oh, very grateful. I mean, still to today. I mean, I um, you know, I still think about it at times, but you know, because of I'm always around kids and and um, teaching and coaching. You know, they've always given asking me questions about how it was it playing with the Al Ming, how was it playing against Michael Jordan and against Kobe. So. I'm, I'm getting those constant questions and reminders, and it just, you know, again, it makes me even more grateful because I can use those experiences to help them and their goals, their aspirations in their life. Did, did you ever play against Allen Iverson? Yes, I did. I did. Actually, my first game ever in the NBA uh, was against um, Allen Iverson, um, and it was right about a couple of weeks before I actually found out I made the team. And so it was uh, obviously another dream that came true, playing against one of the best point guard of all time and um, you know I was on a stage where I had to perform and it was actually my performance in that game that you know really helped uh, I think that helped uh, the coaches decide decide that I was uh, a good fit for uh, the Houston Rocket team during that year. So you're able to pretty much shut down Iverson huh? I'm not going to say I shut him down at all. <laughs> I'm going to say that I produced I produced enough <laughs> To show that I was worthy of a spot on a team, and uh, again, that was my first, my first preseason game, and um, I played almost the whole game. Played almost the whole game as a rookie, trying to make the team. Yeah, I've been I've been chatting with with Gary Moore, which is um, Allen Iverson's manager for for life since he was like eight oh, yeah? nine years okay. old, and we've been trying to get yeah. him involved with the stuff that we're doing on you know what's digital entertainment, the stuff that we're working mm -hmm. on and stuff. And they're All interested, right. so I'm hoping I'm hoping I could get Allen Iverson on the show because uh, I think I think he's a guy that that's totally misunderstood. I've always been a big Allen Iverson fan, and I think yeah. I mean hands down he he changed the whole culture of the NBA. And I think I think he right. needs to get that credit. And I mean you know just listening yeah. to his. Uh, his Hall of Fame speech it was like kind of yeah. like that. That's who he is, and I mean, yeah, I, I I talk a lot with Gary Moore. Not 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 a lot like we're friends, but we talk a lot about business and we talk about you know regular things because Gary Moore is a a super guy. I mean, I've I've basically you know considered him a super guy over the phone and everything, and just the way that Ireland talks about Gary, you know that not too many. Yeah. Uh, not too many players talk about their managers that way, but he considers Gary a father, and and so hopefully I'm gonna pitch Gary to get Allen Iverson on the phone, and then I'm gonna definitely say, Yo, you remember that guy that uh, that shut you down that first game? <laughs> to see, be like, Who? What? To, to see what Allen's uh, like. I don't remember that. Yeah, to see what. So I mean, of course, the next question that I had was, I mean, oh, you would do the whole NBA experience thing again, right? Right. Hands down, right? So Say that again? I mean you would do that hands down. You would you would live the whole NBA experience again. Right? Oh yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't change anything about it at all. Um No, I I definitely I mean it was it was again it was a dream that came true and everything I thought about it of the NBA before I made it, mm -hmm. I mean it came true and it was more of that. So it was just uh definitely something that uh will always be a part of me. And I mean, I remember, and I grew up like, I grew up in the Bronx, New York, and I used to play baseball most of my life. And then I came down to, to play football for a high school in Miami. 
And Miami football was just like, it was crazy. I mean, it was almost like professional for me. And I remember the, the first time I think I was like in, I was in the ninth grade or the 10th grade and we played a jamboree and the coach put me in there. And I was used to playing, you know, baseball in the Bronx where like 35 drunk people were watching the game. And then <laughs> when I went to this jamboree and there were like eight schools and we were playing in a stadium. Yeah. I mean, I felt like, wow, you know, I never played in front of so many people and I got this energy that I remember taking out two guys at the same time and I said, how did I do that? <laughs> I remember looking up and it was kind of like, it w we were playing in a stadium. And, and, and I mean, when the first time that you walked out to an NBA arena, how did that feel, man? Again, it seemed like I was really in a dream. I mean, I, I played in the minor leagues and even overseas. You got two or 3,000 people there, you know. Uh, but to be in a stadium, uh, for instance, San Antonio, uh, their stadium seats like 30,000. Right. And for me to, to, to have that night in and night out, playing against 20, 25, 30,000 people at every city, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And, you, you know, you find, you say you find that energy. To, to go above and beyond because these people are paying their hard earned money to come and watch, you know, some professionals play. And, you know, I had many times because I was a rookie, you know, at almost 30 years old, you know, I've watched so many NBA games and I've seen all these players on TV. Now, all of a sudden, I'm one of them. So I found myself at times in the middle of a game, I'm looking at Michael Jordan, I'm like, man, this is like really my idol. And I had to realize I have to stop him. Right. <laughs> I have to stop him. So it was just so surreal and uh, uh, um, just something that I'm still today, still grateful for, for that experience. And that's part of, part of the reason why I did. I wrote a, I wrote a book, uh, you know, obviously my book, Stroke of, Stroke of Grace, and I talk about all my experiences of all the, the, uh, the legend NBA players I played against and uh, just my whole journey to get to that point. Right. So t tell us about your stroke and then we'll talk about your book. Tell, tell us about yeah, the stroke. Well, tell, tell us that, that day, what happened. I know it was New Year's yeah. Eve or New Year's Day. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Depending yeah. on how you call it, right? Because in Australia, you were in Australia, <laughs> right. right? So yeah. tell us about yeah. that day because, I mean, that day was totally different from the first day you walked on to, to play against Adam right. Iverson, right? <laughs> true, true, true. It was a uh, totally different feeling physically. Um, you know, and, and from that moment of me having a stroke, I mean, as I said in my book, it, it changed my life. I mean, it changed everything about what I thought. Um, it t changed a lot from my past because a lot of things I ended up forgetting because of the symptoms of the stroke. And, uh, you know, in, in, in my recovery, I was, um, you know, I had problems with my, my, my speech, my hearing, uh, memory, as well as my right side of my body. So it, it changed, it changed my life. And, um, you know, obviously, Long story short, because it is so many small details about the the moment, the day I had the stroke. Uh, just 2008, you know, playing professionally over in Australia. Um, just had a game the night before. Um, I played personally. I played well. My team, we won the game, and um, this is New Year's Eve. And uh, the very next day, which is New Year's Day, uh, 2008, <clears throat> I was going to brush my teeth to. Uh, prepare we had a flight that we had to take to the next city to melbourne because uh, we had another game the very next day and um routine once to go turn the, the faucet on to wet my toothbrush and i got a, a tingling feeling in my fingertips on my right right hand and so i didn't think nothing about it until i dropped my toothbrush in the sink without really knowing it and i start to feel the tingling feeling that was kind of going up my arm so it went from my elbow to my shoulder, and then all of a sudden I got this throbbing headache like I was getting hit in the head with, with, with a, a hard object. And so I um, got a little dizzy, a little nauseated, and so I was walking to the bed to go lay down because I just didn't feel right, like I was going to faint. Um, my entire right arm became numb, and it was just something that I felt before as far as, you know, you, you sleep in on your arm the wrong way and um, kind of, you know, you don't have the feeling because you've been laying on it the wrong way, but, you know, obviously I was standing up, so there was no reason for this to be happening to me at this time. And so, um, long story short again, I just uh, end up standing up, 
thought about a stroke, but I was like, I'm too young. I'm only this time I was only 34 years old, and as I went to go look in the mirror to see if I had any facial dis disfigurement, um, I saw as I smiled, the right side of my face was light drooping, and um, it didn't it didn't feel right. It didn't look right, and so as I went to lay back down, because again I was feeling nauseated, like I was going to faint, I laid down for a couple more seconds stood back up and then I just fell to the ground. Um, at this time, my entire right side was in, in, immobile. I couldn't feel anything. Um, man on the ground trying to get my footing and I was in a room by myself, in a hotel room by myself. Mm -hmm. So um, it was it was definitely a, an experience I would never forget. I would never wish this on anyone, but it was just the toughest thing I had to deal with, not knowing why my body wasn't working. And um, so, um, end up going to the hospital the very next day. A lot of other details that happened in between me going to the hospital, right. but you know I didn't even get to the I didn't even get to the hospital until the next day. Um, oh, excuse me. I end up going to uh, my roommate. Ended up coming back in after a few minutes, and so uh, just got ourselves ready, and we ended up having. I had to go take the flight. We had a, a flight that we had to take. Mm -hmm. uh, with our team to the, to the next city. And so I didn't get to the hospital until later on that day. Um, and then I didn't get the proper treatment until the very next day uh, because I had some other symptoms. And uh, that's when they finally told me uh, that I had a stroke and my basketball career was over. And then all my recovery started. All right. my recovery started. And definitely something that I would will, I will never forget, not being able to you know, remember certain things. I at that time I was have three daughters now, but my daughters were very young, and they were they were just getting to Australia with my wife, and I was yeah, I couldn't remember so many different things. And the one thing I want to make sure I couldn't uh, I want to make sure I could remember was their names. And I just remember in the hospital re repeating their names over and over because there's other things I just couldn't remember. And I said if I'm going to remember <laughs> one thing, it's going to always going to be be my daughter's names. And wow. so um, it, it was a, tr a, tr a trying experience for me, man. And, um, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm doing now, because I am an advocate of stroke, is making sure people know those warning signs, because uh, the warning signs could really uh, help uh, people understand about, more about stroke and, and pretty much make people understand that when you are having those symptoms, you know, call 911 as soon as possible, get to the hospital so that you can start your treatment. Right. So, so go ahead and plug your book, plug your website, plug any, everything you want to plug, man. Yeah, well, my, my book name is obviously Stroke of Grace. Um, you can purchase there uh, the, the book on, uh, on my website, which is the strokeofgrace.org. So that's www.strokeofgrace.org. Um, you also can follow me, obviously, on Instagram, um, Joaquin Hawkins. I'm also I'm a coach, so... My uh, Instagram name is uh, Coach Hawk247, and um, you know, obviously, you can follow me also on Facebook at Joaquin Hawkins. Yeah, That's perfect, yeah. man. So, so let me ask you a question. Of course, part of this is, and I don't want to get into a whole bunch of this, but part of part of yeah. your stroke led to your financial disaster, right? Yeah. So yeah. how how was life at the rock? How was life at the bottom, man? What, what was life like uh, at the bottom? It, it was, Without going into a lot of yeah. details. But there's a lot of people out there that don't understand what rock bottom is. Because yeah. I have friends that yeah. say rock bottom and they're, you know, they're down to $150,000. You know, that's rock right. bottom. I've been down to like 150 cents. You know what I'm saying? Right. Or negative 150 cents. But right. I'm saying, right. what was rock bottom for you, man? I, I, I know that, I know, and I mean, if you want to put it out there, because I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in my book. Obviously, I, I, no, I don't I know mind this. because I think the only the only way people are going to understand that is they if they do know, as you said, what is rock bottom? What is it? What it, it what it entails of you trying to get back up um, from when you coming back from you know for, for for from so little. So I don't have a mind. I don't have a problem at all um, explaining of, of kind of what rock bottom was for me. Um, obviously, it was more severe because I, I have a wife. And three daughters, mm -hmm. and at this time, you know, they were they were they were young. I mean, they were only this time. I think it was uh, they were seven, five, and three 
when I just lost a- absolutely everything. When I say everything, not only financially, um, but we are, are we lost our house, our house, we lost our house to foreclosure. Mm-hmm. Um, we had to live in a hotel room, um, the five of us, along with my mother. So not only did I lost my house, but because I wasn't playing professionally anymore, I lost my mom's house. So, I mean, just imagine, you know, living in a hotel room, a, you know, 14 by 14 room where you have your wife, three daughters, and your mom, and, you know, they all looking at you like, where are we going to eat tonight? Um, you know, we're going to be able to stay in this hotel room another day. And so, um, I mean, my struggle wasn't just a personal struggle, but I struggled because I had other people that were depending on me. Right. And I mean, so, at, that, uh, at that time, physically you were okay again or were you still struggling? Yeah, I, I, was, I was better. Yeah, I was better. Uh, this, this actually happened about three to four years um, after my stroke. But mm-hmm. again, because I wasn't working or well, I still wasn't able to play anymore, uh, because of my stroke and, you know, how, um, you know, certain things that didn't return after my stroke. Like, I still had a little problem with my memory. Mm-hmm. Um, physically, my, my, I was better, but there were still problems I was having on my right side. So I wasn't able to work. Um, you know, I couldn't get a 9, a 9 to 5. And when I did get a 9 to 5, it was just always something where uh, my, um, just pretty much my skill, a certain way that I was thinking. It wasn't always there. And so, you know, I ended up getting um, released from my job that I had. I was working um, for about two to three months before they ended up saying that, you know, they, they had to let me go just because I wasn't able to do the work. Right. Um, and then when I tried to go back to play basketball, obviously, when you Google my name, it shows that, that I had a stroke. And so no one could really, you know, trust if I was going to be physically and healthy enough to play anymore. So it was like it just limited all my uh, my resources of, of trying to make some income for my family. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was tough. It was, it was definitely tough. And, uh, you know, but again, it, it made me a better man. It made me better uh, to, to understand that you have to find and adapt your own way of how you want to live. And, um, and that's when I ended up creating uh, Hawk Hoops, and, and that's kind of what I'm doing now. So, okay, so now life is, is good. And, and I mean, and I mean, people who've been at rock bottom, like me, and I, I tell you my number one rock bottom experience that I don't yeah. share with too many people. Uh, but yeah. what I, we were living in Costa Rica, and I had both my sons with me, uh, my little son and my older son, who happens to be a rap star. Uh, but I won't tell you who he is. And and he was living with us in Costa Rica. He's from a previous marriage. And, you know, he was getting into some situations in Miami or whatever. So I went and picked him up and scooped him up in Miami and brought him brought him to live with me in Costa Rica so you could see that, you know, the life is life is not the USA. But I mean we lived in the city. We lived in you know, we lived like the camp nowhere. We lived in the city, Costa Rica, San Jose. And and my young son started kindergarten, a little guy. And I went to pick him up, and we had exactly uh, the equivalent of one dollar, and the bus cost one dollar to get back home from his school. And my my little son said, "Hey, I want an ice cream." So my big son wanted an ice cream, so they cost fifty cents each. And so I went and bought the ice cream, and I said, "Oh, we'll just walk, you know, a couple of miles, not far, right?" So, so opening the ice cream, my young son drops his ice cream and I had no more money. So it was like, you know, I looked at that ice cream and I said to myself, I never want to be in a situation where I have to look at my older son and show him, you know, give it to your little guy, you know, give it to the little guy, you know, and he did. You know, my older son was like 14, 15 years old at the time and he, you know, he, we, we made, we spoke without speaking and I just said, you know, and we looked at that and I looked at that ice cream and I said, man, I never want to be in a situation where I have to, you know, tell my son I can't buy you another ice cream. And I don't want to be in a situation where I could buy him a million ice creams either because that's, that's kind of bad too. But I remember looking at that ice cream and that was kind of like a mental picture that stood in. And I remember calling my friend Wayne and saying, man, I, you know, I'm in rock. I, I, I'm rock bottom, man. I can't buy my son another ice cream. And at that time, my, my wife was actually working in Costa Rica. She was earning 
you know, Costa Rica wages or whatever at that time, maybe like 400 or 500 bucks a month or whatever. So, I mean, you know, it was just a situation where I had to look down at a, at a, at a melting ice cream that hit the floor and it was like kind of slow motion and cinematic, so to speak. And I remember looking at my, at my son and he looked at it and he was, you know, being a five year old, he was just going to go down and grab it and pick it up and, and it was, you know, it just wasn't edible anymore. But that was kind of my rock bottom, man. And I mean, when I sit down with, with people and their, their rock bottom is, you know, I'm down to my last $50,000. I'm down to my last $80,000. I look at them and I'm like, we're not the same, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. our rock bottom is not the same. And and actually, when I met you, man, I mean, I don't even know if you know this, but I was pretty much living in a car. You know, pretty much living in I a car. That. I, I, I remember you, you had to tell me about that story, too. I, I didn't know it the day that I met you. <laughs> but, no, because I... You know, later on, you did tell me. You did tell me about that. Yeah, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and if you listen to, to the to the previous podcast, the intro podcast of this, you'll, you'll see that. I, I tell people, man, I mean, you got to have... You know, billionaires don't walk around with a whole bunch of money in their pocket. Neither do millionaires. But their attitude tells you that they they have a million dollars or they have a billion dollars. And and I went into that meeting at Olive Garden where we met, like I was a billionaire, like I was a millionaire. I wasn't gonna, you know, because my attitude is millionaire. So you have to have an, a millionaire attitude because the minute you walk with your head down, people are gonna yeah. treat you like you're some, you know, right. some some person who's who's not capable of doing anything. And I mean, sometimes we're all capable of doing something just at a, at some point in our, in our life, we get to a point where we think we can't do anything. And most people at this state of the, at this state of the, of the world, they're at that point. They, they can't feel like they can't do anything. I mean, my entertainment attorney, Robert Celestine, I mean, and I don't, I can't say the client now, but he has a client that, you know, became a millionaire writing a song in 12 minutes. So, I mean, you know, a guy who, like me, who's, you know, a career, you know, who, who, who learned something all his life, went to school formally, you know, went to two or three universities, and, you know, I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill. When I sit down and I put a program together like Broke, Broken Doesn't Equal Broken, it takes a lot more than 12 minutes, and no one will give me a million dollars. His client got a couple, started a bidding war, you know, where, where they went in with $800,000, and then they ended up getting like $3 million for one, for one song. You know, for one, you know, for a song that I'm like, you know, I, I joke around with Robert, and I tell him, hey, man, when is, when is the English version coming out? You know what I'm saying? Because I can't even understand it. But someone gives this kid $3 million. He's 19 years old. And he wrote a song in 12 minutes, you know, with a beat that he bought for 200 bucks or whatever online. And he's a millionaire today. He was able to buy his mother the house, the car, the, you know, the everything. And I'm saying, what are dreams made of? Are they made of, you know, are they made up in 12 minutes? Or are they made up in things that we're doing? And I, you know, I came to the conclusion talking to my wife one morning because we always talk for an hour every morning over, over coffee. And, 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 you know, she said, Mark, you just got to, you know, just keep doing what you're doing because you do a lot of positive things. In 10 years, they're not going to remember that kid that you got paid $3 million for that song. And they're not going to remember the song and the song is not going to be relevant. What you're doing today is going to be relevant. Even if it's not relevant to nobody, it's relevant to your son because your son and your other son could say, my daddy did that, my father did that. And, and so that, that was the point that I said, you know what, I'm just going to do things that my son will be proud of, not all my friends on Facebook, all my friends on Twitter, all my followers on, on Instagram. I don't really give a, you know, give a damn about what they think, what I do and what I don't do and how I do it. I'm still going to do it. I mean, and that's what I do. You know what I'm saying? So getting back to that... You know, I'm gonna wrap this up quick. Well, I want to say this well, before yeah, we get to that. Some because I, I mean, you brought up a lot of good points, but you know, one thing I I have learned this through my struggle, through my adversities, is that you have to create your own. You know, create your own opportunity. You know, a lot of opportunities are not gonna go your way, as you said a little bit earlier, if you don't take chances, if you don't, you know, try to 
to, you know, make something out of nothing. And, you know, sometimes, as you said, the big dreams come true because you do, you're taking a chance, and, you know, it's, it's nothing better than to take a chance on yourself. And so um, I've, I've been able to, to learn that myself. Um, again, I, again my, my, broke, my broke is, you know, having uh, a family, uh, I mean, uh, living lives, small children depend on me, me not coming through for them, living in a hotel room, becoming, I mean, flat broke where I'm falling bankrupt and I'm, I'm doing personal basketball training just to go feed them dinner. And so, um, you know, using that opportunity to create more opportunities and, you know, now I have a, a club travel team of, of over 100 players. And so I've been able to create my own opportunities, um, you know, obviously to support my family, but also to, to feel another dream that I had if, if in uh, teaching kids and, and helping them pursue their, their own dreams. Well, that's cool, man. And so hopefully, hopefully, uh, hopefully soon when, when I get this thing, Broke, broke, broke doesn't equal broken is, is part of a very big series that I'm doing. It's starting with podcasts and we're scaled up to video and then we're going to do events where we bring speakers like you that speak to, you know, speak to corporate, uh, corporate uh, prisoners, uh, people in churches, wherever there's, wherever there's a need. And I mean, right now, man, I feel there's a need because I mean, I think if it wasn't for my son and my wife, I think I probably would have been homeless or living on a beach somewhere. But I wasn't going to continue to try to fight for something where it was just hearing no, no, no. And you know what? I got used to the word no. But I love the word no. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, uh, in July, I walked into Cristiano Ronaldo's office, and I don't get the word no anymore. I get the word, ah, you know, let's see. It's a good idea. We love the idea. And wow, you know, just make it a little bit more real right, and right. we're in, you know. And I, I get that. And I don't see that as a no anymore. And maybe I was seeing those same type of responses as no before. Now I see them as... At least, you know, there's so many people that want to break the ice with Cristiano Ronaldo. And I was able to walk into his office and sit down with the guy who handles all his, all his big deals with, you know, with Nike and, and everything. And, and I was able to sit down with that guy. And that guy knows me now. And this was, I went into his office with $5 in my pocket, well, five euros. But, you know, I was able to do it. I walked, I, you know, went to Portugal. And, you know, sat, sat down in his office and I did that. So, I mean, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your pocket. It's how many ideas. And like, like you said, man, you said create your own opportunities. And, and you know, that's, that's what we're doing, man. So hopefully uh, you'll be in Barcelona soon and you'll be definitely one of my, one of the people that are always going to be part of my, my network of, of motivators, because you're definitely a motivator, sure. Hawk. Thank you for, for joining me on my very first podcast with a, my very first yeah. um, guest on my podcast, man. It's, it's uh, an honor, right. man. And right. hopefully, like I said, man, we got to get off and talk, talk a little bit more every, every week and motivate each other and just kind of stay on board, because we're not there yet, man. I'm, uh, and like we said, even, we said earlier... Even. In another conversation, we said we, we got to get to the point where we know that our children don't, where our kids don't have to worry about what uh, yes, what uh, what we're going through now, and just you know, because it's, it's possible. I mean, we, we we have to invest in in certain things so that they don't have to worry about that, and they can focus on being creative and not work on not focus so much on surviving. And I think what happens with us is that we focus so much on surviving that we forget that we're creative. And, and I think that's part of where most of, most of the people who've been through rock bottom have to figure it out. And we have to figure out a way, like I said, man, and I believe this, I think your book should be able to, 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 to do that because there's a lot of people dealing with strokes. There's a lot of people dealing with, with a lot of things that your book covers. And I think we just have to get that you know, you have to get that. And if I can help you in any way, get that book to the next level, you can count on me, buddy. All right? Good, Good to hear, man. Appreciate so that. Thank you. I'm motivated, though. I can say that. I am motivated. Nah, <laughs> you are motivated. Yo, you're, a hero. you're my hero, man. I mean, you're my hero, man. And, and I, have, I don't have too many heroes, but you're one of my heroes. And I follow you on Facebook, and, 
And, you know, there's certain people that you see on Facebook, certain, you know, you got that little love-hate relationship, man. I haven't right, found right. no hate for you. And you know me, I'm outspoken. I talk about everybody. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't care because I don't have anything to lose, man. I mean, none of, the, none of those people that read my post ever said, yo, Mark, you know, do you need $100? you need $5? you need a dollar? Nobody. So I don't really care what they care. What they think, I don't care what they say. But, you know, if I put something out there that's going to harm somebody who I do care about, and I care about the 1,502 people that I have on Facebook, because I know all of them. And the problem is I try to go one by one and erase them, but I have a history with all of them because I treat everybody like a person. But the, the problem with that is that when people don't treat you as a person, you take it personal. And I, I stopped doing that. I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't care. I'm going to tell my feelings. As long as my wife, my son, and my other son, and my daughter, they don't, they don't hate me, I don't care who hates me. Because I, my mother, you know, disconnected me from Facebook. I still chat with her and talk with her and still love her to death. But I'm saying, she didn't like me on Facebook. And I don't like me on Facebook sometimes, but life is not Facebook. Life is just a couple of posters on Facebook of my life. Exactly. But who I am exactly. outside of Facebook is a totally different person. So thank you, Hawk. I'm going to send you a link of the podcast. Please share it with people. Please do. And, uh, Please do. and it should be up. I'm going, to have, I'm going to have a couple of pieces up, uh, uh, you know, just kind of plugging it away for the next couple of days. And it'll be up on the 7th of, of, of January. So... Thank you, my friend, man. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. I, I, I'm yes, planning sir. on going to uh, to the States this year. We're going to kind of just go kind of all around the place. So I want to yeah, definitely have man. you. I definitely want to. I'll sleep on your floor, man. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure <laughs> really? you'll let me. I'm sure you'll let me. So. Oh, man. It will be my, my wife and kids. They'll be like, uh, who is this person in our house, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but it's all good. I haven't had any wife and kids not love me, so (laughs) they'll love my son, man. Yes, sir. We'll love each other, man. You keep doing what you're doing, man. That's it, dude. You you keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm here in in support in any way I can, and um, and I'm proud of you, man. I'm really is. I mean, we've had this conversation a couple of years now, and I mean, you've been the same person from day one. You haven't changed at all. You haven't. Uh, you know, change your way of living. You you haven't made it seem like you're bigger or better than anybody else, man. So, um, you know, I always love to support people like that, and especially you. So you, you keep doing what you're doing. Because as I said, you, you motivate me. <laughs> Thank you, Hawk. And I'm glad I could do that, man. Because, I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, man, it's all we got, man. And, I mean, hopefully we can start the rock bottom army and just take over. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, Let's Hawk. Take care, man. All right now. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye.